Welcome into the KSO Show, a Sunday edition for everybody to get excited, ready to look ahead to the next week of K-State football after they yet again take advantage of a not-so-good team. We learned that pretty quick yesterday with Houston, and it also seemed like uh, the Cougars, they weren't too interested in showing any fight either. They were content to just roll over, and uh, Dana Holgerson, he probably was like, yeah, you know what, not happening today, I'll roll over with them because... Uh, he he got upset a couple times about a few of the calls, but really he he wasn't, I don't think, too beat up about what happened yesterday. I think there was probably an expectation. He seems like a pretty realistic guy, so I think if you'd probably asked him, and you know he he won't say this <laughs> publicly, but he'd say to a lot of people privately that yeah, we're gonna get our ass kicked. We're gonna this is gonna this is gonna how it's gonna be in the Big Twelve for almost every week of the season. I think he would say that last week against Texas was more of a surprise than getting beat 41 to nothing by K-State was. So uh, that's just the the nature of all these new teams in the Big 12. Houston is still the only one that has a win over one of the, I guess, BYUs in that category now. But it's not a lot of wins to go around. And we thought UCF might be able to get it done finally yesterday against West Virginia. And there were a handful of games yesterday in the Big 12 that, the outcome was going to tell me really nothing about one team if they want it. It would just say a lot more about the other. And for West Virginia and UCF, it doesn't tell me much about West Virginia. It just tells me that UCF does, in fact, suck. And the same type of deal down in, in Waco took place. Iowa State winning that game doesn't mean anything. But if Baylor had won that game, it would have just kind of confirmed what we expect Iowa State actually is. But, you know, the the Big 12 is such a – I mean, it's clear when you have five teams tied at the top, only seven of your teams are above 500 in league play. The Big 12 is such a league where the haves this year are taking care of business against the have-nots. And it's going to really come down to what you do against each other. And to this point, five of those schools have one loss against each other, and then the two lost schools also come into the mix slightly. So we'll get to all of that throughout the day, talking about the Cats and the Cougs first, though. Uh, immediate takeaways from yesterday's game as K-State found a way to get a, a pretty comfortable victory. I will let Drew fire us off. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, my real instant takeaway is that uh, there there isn't a whole lot to take away from <coughs> that game necessarily because I just think that you could have listed off of like probably 30, 40 places. And uh, I don't think that Manhattan, Kansas would have been in the top 30 or 40 places that Houston wanted to be yesterday. Like it, it was pretty evident from the jump that they would rather be anywhere else because it was too cold and they aren't very good and they just kind of wanted to get home. But it, it was, I think I texted one of my friends because a lot of my friends will ask like, hey, like, well, what did you think of the game and everything? And I was like, it was the most ho-hum drubbing of a team that was bad like you'd ever seen like it was just a very methodical we're just gonna get four or five yards every play get every third down because that apparently is the new k-state thing and then we're gonna stop you on every third down because that's the new k-state thing so it's like they won pretty handily but i'm not sure what what it means because i think that a lot of teams would have beat houston pretty badly yesterday yeah, I'm going to say uh, methodical is a good word Drew used there, I think, of, of what how that game played out. Um, <clears throat> I do think the weather had a factor. Uh, I was The only surprise I would say is I, how K-State's defense dominated the Houston passing game was a little bit more than I thought. Donovan Smith was arguably the second-best quarterback in the Big 12 coming into that game, I think, looking at the numbers. And K-State held him to – 2.2 yards per pass play and a 24% success rate on passing plays uh, before garbage time, essentially through the first three quarters. So that's pretty. that was the most impressive thing I took away from the game. Uh, offensively, K-State did what I thought they would against a bad defense and took control of the game early. Um, Will Howard played really well at quarterback and had his what I would say is even though the yardage isn't the his best, I would say it's his best throwing game of the year. 
um, pretty efficient throwing the ball. Um, very good job with the K State passing game. Still had the the nice balance with the run game. So that was nice to see. But I kind of expected that against the Houston defense. I just didn't expect to hold them to no points for sure in this game. I did not think a shutout was coming. So the last two weeks, I do think that's two pretty good offenses. You just held to three points in two weeks. Um, so the defense step really stepping up going into next week is is probably my storyline from that game. Yeah, I mean, it feels like the we we've talked about it. the sack numbers haven't necessarily been there. I mean, only one yesterday for K State, but it feels like they're finding ways to get more and better pressure that is effective in knocking the the passing game of their opponent off balance a little bit. And that's really the most important thing when it comes to trying to help guys that were trying to work their way along in the secondary and the safety seemed to have gotten it figured out. The corners keep getting better. Uh, they got the interception <clears throat> yesterday from Will Lee, and I, I think everybody's starting to play well on on defense. And so they're, they're they're in a good spot right now. I mean, I I think the biggest thing that I took away from yesterday, um, and it became pretty apparent early, that was the type of game that you wanted from Will Howard. And I because I've said it all along, K State's highest ceiling this season comes with Will Howard at quarterback. But I was skeptical that we would get to see that version of Will Howard that you needed. And that's why I would have been comfortable. They just said, all right, we're going to ride this thing out with Avery. But now things are coming together at the right time. I mean, the biggest game of your season is this coming week, and your defense is playing the best it's played all season over the last really four games. I mean, they were putting some tough spots in Stillwater and played fairly well when they needed to. Uh, they just let O-State move the ball down the field pretty easily to get into field goal range. But since then, they've been really good. And now offensively, uh, it, Will Howard playing like this can win you a game in Austin. And the offense is starting to get things figured out. Like they're just in a, they're in a great spot right now. And uh, certainly three, four weeks ago, none of us would have expected this. I think some people thought that K State might shut down the football program after the loss in Stillwater, um, but they've rebounded and they're in position to try and get back to Arlington and. Would be fun. probably the favorite to do so if they if they beat Texas. I mean, whoever wins that game next week is probably you can't say a lock because there are still games left to be played. But I mean, K State, the toughest game that they would have left is the, the road trip to Lawrence, Texas. Their toughest game left. The argument would probably be that it's at Iowa State the next to last week of the season, which tells a lot about their schedule. And then Oklahoma has. Oklahoma State next weekend so that's really the toughest thing left on on their their schedule as well so this is this is a position where it's an important week for K-State we'll see what they're able to kind of get done but uh, they've, they've done enough right now and getting quarterback figured out to where at least you feel like you have a guy going into the game against Texas is really important because I, I didn't think that you could go into that doing the whole feel it out is it Will is it Avery what you can do in that game, though, is you can have a quick trigger and you can say, all right, Will doesn't have it. Like, we're going to go with Avery. And also, like, Avery still probably needs a role in that Texas game. Uh, he's too good not to, and, and there are ways to use it. And it, it's not like the the Jason Bean, Jalen Daniels thing where you're having to put Jason Bean at receiver because he's that good. You got to get him in the game. It's, it's Avery Johnson has a legit skill set at quarterback that you can use. And it's okay to sacrifice some Will Howard snaps there for Avery Johnson. So that's uh, what we got going on. All right, moving on. Cause for concern. Anything that stood out yesterday in a 41 nothing blowout win that you're still a little unsure about, that you don't know if anything is – you're not so convinced on what's going to happen? Because, honestly, nothing yesterday really worried me with, with what I saw from K-State. I think Houston – Early on, that they were doing a good job of trying to surprise K State by running it more than what they would have expected, and that led to a lot of the big run busts early. But it didn't impact the K State defense at all because they just stood up and when they needed to, got off the field. And Houston's really only scoring opportunity came on the missed field goal after the Avery Johnson fumble. So, uh, I mean, you could say that, but I don't think that that was anything other than just a product of, hey, they know that we do this a lot of the time. I mean, what was it like 70% of Houston's plays going into that game were pass plays. And Donovan Smith, like Fan had said, had been probably the second best quarterback in the league. So everybody knew Houston was going to throw the ball. And I think they went into it with the idea, okay, 
Let's try and sneak one on them. They did an okay job of it. It just didn't last for very long. K-State was able to adjust and, and make a difference. And I mean, looking ahead to next week, Texas is probably a team that right now you you look and you kind of profile and say, okay, I mean, it's not like Malik Murphy was anything stellar throwing the ball. They're going to try and let Jonathan Brooks run it and dominate there. I mean, K-State can focus pretty heavily on Texas's run game next week, so I don't think what happened this week is going to be anything to freak out about that Texas is going to run all over you now because Houston had a little bit of success early in the game uh, when K-State was expecting the pass. Yeah, it, Houston was kind of – they did the George Costanza. You, you think they were going to do this? Well, I'm going to do the exact opposite because, I mean, I said it. In the first half, I said they're running a lot more than number one. They probably should be yeah. because of score and that I just expected them to. I mean, there there was a point. I think it was after their first two drives because they were they were barely on the field. But Houston had ran more than they threw, which surprised me a lot. Uh, I guess my cause for concern, if we're going to throw one out there that we have to have, is uh, the, the vertical passing game just strictly because there was only like one downfield pass or two downfield passes. But they, I mean, they're, were, they're were both complete. So, I mean, for, if you're going to nitpick, they, they didn't really try to uncork it very much yesterday, but when they did, I mean, Phillip Brooks was wide open on the touchdown. And then, uh, then they had the deep pass to Phillip Brooks. That was caught. That was one of Will Howard's best throws of the season. Um, but I mean, the, the one that Phillip Brooks was wide open for the touchdown. I mean, that people have been kind of asking, why are they running so many jet sweeps? That's why, because they can fake it and scheme it up and Phillip Brooks will be wide open or any receiver. Cause I, I, I think that any receiver would have been wide open on that play. Yeah, the, I'm not concerned about this, but the only concern slightly would be how does Avery Johnson handle kind of sort of being benched, you know, after one drive in meaningful time in that game, <clears throat> and then Will Howard taking back over. Maybe that was part of the plan in that game. I don't know. Kleiman, uh, after the game, said he really didn't know. He, You know, he didn't know either. You'd have to ask Klein about it later in the week. So um, it'll be interesting to see what he says. I, I do think they do a good job handling those two guys, and they have all year. Um, I think we did. You know, you could kind of hear, I think you got, you, Manson, you pointed out last week, you could kind of hear a little bit of disappointment in Will Howard of <clears throat> kind of what was going on. So, and after the game, he seemed pretty jovial in his interview. So that's, that's an interesting dynamic. I don't, I don't think it's an issue with this team. I think they have a good culture, but how he, does he have the same type of confidence going into the next week? If he does need to come into the Texas game um, after, after just playing really garbage time drives in this one. Well, I think I, it's, I, oh, go ahead, Drew. Oh. I meant to say this when uh, after uh, Mason, you talked about the K State ceiling is higher with Will at quarterback going forward, and it's something that I've kind of thought about. That you're you're exactly on the on you hit the nail on the head because K State is better when Will Howard's going to be the quarterback because you can pick your spots that you want Avery Johnson to come in. It's a lot harder, I think, to have a a package for like Will Howard to come in. Yeah. Where, where like if it's short yardage or like you just need a spark and you think that you need a big play, that's when you put Avery Johnson in. It, it's harder to pick with Will Howard. And that's not saying that Will Howard has been bad because I, I thought that Chris Kleiman was pretty on point with that. That was one of Will Howard's best games of his career uh, yesterday. But I, I think that the ceiling is higher because you can do more things with Avery Johnson that I think that can surprise people than if you put Will Howard in. Well, yeah, I, I just I, I look at it as this like there's there is certainly that element like if if you go to Avery Johnson as your quarterback, there's not a realm in which Will Howard should play in the game in my eyes because you're not going to do something different to surprise him. I mean, Will Howard can 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 run the football, but he's not a runner. It's just it has to be there for him and it has to kind of be predicated on he's in there doing all the other stuff over the course of the game. So like, you know, the stuff that Will's good at is like, it's third and four and you're just going to have him shift around and there he goes past one of the tackles. You can't really do that if it's like, okay, Avery's in the game, he's playing quarterback and then one play, hey, Will's really good at this. Well, Will is really good at that because he's got everything else that he can do. And I look at it this way, like 
the reason I say this, it's not just the fact that you can't throw Will in there for a couple plays and have like special packages for him like you can Avery, but it's also just I would rather have a guy that's played now playing his fourth year of college football at quarterback than a true freshman, even though we know how wildly talented and impressive Avery Johnson has been early. There are still going to be moments where it just doesn't click. Um, now, yesterday, I, I don't know. I think that the fumble thing, I, that was probably more about also how Will Howard was playing in the game and things were going well. And they just said, okay, well, we kind of disrupted the rhythm there. Let's not play around anymore. Um, and so they went back to it. I don't think it, I, it – I mean, the fumble certainly had something to do with it, but um, not everything. But you just like that's going to happen. There are going to be mistakes, and Will Howard, we know, can make some throws. He can make impressive throws yeah. and do some really good things for K State because we came in this year thinking that he could be, you know, an NFL draft pick, one of the best quarterbacks in the Big Twelve, and it, it kind of fell off. It tanked, but like that guy is still in there. You don't just do it for seven games last year and not have the ability to do it anymore. The ability is always there. It's just a matter of on if the, the mental side is going to go into it and if he can process the game still. And it appears that he's getting back to that point. And I think a lot of it probably has to do uh, with the way that some of the other guys are starting to play for K-State. And I think for the most part has something to do with how the offense is starting to go. And I think that they are now finding um, kind of a, a rhythm and an understanding of what they are and what they aren't. So, Let's dive into our, our big topic of the day. Very simple question. Is 2022 Will Howard back? Is the Big 12 champion quarterback ready to go back to his form? And uh, then we'll dive into some of the, the bigger stuff that comes off of that in a little bit. But uh, where is Will Howard in you know relativity to where he was playing uh, all of last season when he got into games? Uh, I, I'll go ahead. Well, and on Will Howard's last 11 drives, K-State scored eight touchdowns. So that's a pretty good rate. That's over five points per drive. Um, like I said, the past game yesterday <clears throat> had a 63% success rate, which is the best of the season for K-State pass game in non-garbage time and averaged over eight yards per pass play call. So that, that includes sacks in there. So I thought <clears> – <throat> We're seeing, you know, granted, Houston's defense is not very good. TCU's defense last week was much better on paper uh, or in the metrics. But either way, that's still a pretty good two-game set after Will Howard scored three points on four drives against Texas Tech. So I think you've seen a, a, a focus from him and kind of a, a response to a bad game in, at Lubbock where – you know, Avery Johnson got all the publicity, and I think Will Howard handled it maturely. You know, I, I do think he had some frustration in his voice, uh, maybe in some some press conferences, but I, I do think we've seen him respond. And uh, I agree with Mason on the ceiling being the highest just because you have a experience, you have the total passing game package, you have most of the running game package. Even if you don't have the explosiveness of Avery Johnson, you still have an effective running game uh effective guy making the reads and you know you know we talked about how well um Treshawn Ward played with Avery Johnson in Texas Tech you know the argument could be made DJ Giddens has played even better than that the last two games paired with Will Howard and I, I can get to, into some of DJ's numbers too but that all that working together I think we're seeing a, a good Will Howard response and nearing the level week spot we thought we'd see less this year all year I'll jump in real quick here uh, to, to throw something in that I, I was I was going to say, and I, I want to get it in there before we get too far away from it and because I just think it's important to put out there. I, I think if you look at the quarterback room at K-State right now, and this goes off of, you know, Will's – you can hear the frustration and see it this past week when he spoke and everything else. Like, it bothers him. What people should not get confused about, though, is that that isn't frustration towards Avery Johnson or the coaches or yeah. his team. It's just frustration at the situation for himself individually. And that's okay. Like it, as long as that's not going to impact how he performs when he does have to go out there or how he treats the other guys. And by all indications from what we've seen on video, from what we've heard from the, the coaches and Avery Johnson himself, it is not impacting his relationship with Avery Johnson 
or his attitude and how he gets ready for a game and you know everything else that goes with it because like it, it's fair for him to be that way he, he's he's pissed off at himself and, and just that he's in this spot again and it's even tougher on a guy that has had this happen relentlessly in his career I mean four years for Will Howard and in some way in all four of those years he has been a part of a situation where he's going to get jockeyed back and forth and uh, it's the same type of deal like Avery Johnson has the right to be frustrated from how yesterday played out I mean he probably did not expect to only play one snap before it was garbage time and it was a fumble and he didn't get a shot after that probably can be pretty upset about it Jake Rubley is another guy that by all indications like easily can be upset about the position he's in I mean he was he was the first four star quarterback that that Kleiman recruited to K State, and he's done nothing but sit on the bench. And it doesn't look like he's ever going to have a significant role at K State. But by all indications, where he can be upset about his situation, he probably is. He doesn't take it out on his teammates. And every time you look, it looks like he, Avery Johnson, Will Howard, they are the best of buddies out there. And so all three of these guys have their own thing that they are dealing with and they put it to the side when they need to, when it comes to being a part of their team. So I just thought that was important to throw mm -hmm. out there when we talk about the Will Howard stuff, especially because I know that some of the Will haters that are still out there probably would have used it as ammunition against him. You shouldn't, it's unfair uh, because we would all be the exact same way. I mean, it's, it is essentially like if D Y told me, Hey, uh, we're just going to, we're going to have drew go ahead and he's going to be the, I don't know, pick a situation. He's going to be handling all the, the YouTube stuff for now. And it's like, and I've been relegated. Okay. I'm happy for drew. Like I want drew to <laughs> succeed. You know, I want him to, to keep doing good things, but also individually I'm like, what the heck, what's wrong with me? And I have to evaluate my performance and I'll be upset about it. No doubt. Um, so we're all like that. Everybody can pick out a personal situation where that's happened to them, but uh, I think all three of the quarterbacks do a good job of, of not letting it impact the stuff that actually matters uh, as a team perspective. Yeah, I mean, that that, that is a great point. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something that I've kind of thought about, and Mason, I know that I, I've told you that I hate when people like do this, but if you take away the Oklahoma <laughs> State game, <laughs> Will Howard has 19 touchdowns and four turnovers. I like if you it hasn't always been pretty but if you take away the three picks in the Oklahoma State game he's been just fine yeah so it, it's crazy to think about like what happens if that game doesn't happen like oh, where where yeah. is where's K-State at right now yeah. and like and like so as bad as it kind of seems like it was and things kind of got off the rails and I mean I say I say that stat, but then like it was rough in the Oklahoma State game and for the half against Texas Tech that he played. But Will Howard has 19 touchdowns, seven turnovers, hasn't turned the ball over in the last uh, three games, which I mean, technically is like two and a half since it was a lot of Avery Johnson in the Texas Tech game. But you can see that he's starting to turn a corner again. And I mean, it's next week where you'll really see what has gone on and like, has he really turned the corner? But if you just look at the raw numbers, I mean, I think that everybody probably would have taken 19 total touchdowns, seven turnovers, eight games into the season for Will Howard. It, it's just one game. It was not great. Yeah, no, that's that's true. One game was not very good. Um, I'm looking here to see where where we would have to go back and figure out uh, what how many passes Will Howard has gone without throwing an interception. Uh, uh, so you're you're gonna be the jinx. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> it's uh, uh, well, I would be so the last six passes of the Oklahoma State game uh, combined with everything else that's going on. Uh, look, I mean, he's he's playing better, and I think the turnover thing is key because that was the one area that was very elevated. Um, so, yeah, he's gone 48 straight passes without a pick. By the um, way, he's he's still pretty close to on pace to uh, break the single-season passing touchdown record. He's on pace for 22.75. Yeah, you're going to need to pick it up a little bit to <laughs> make that prediction go for me. Um, but 
like thinking about the the situation for him, like limiting the turnovers is huge. That I expected them to be at an elevated level this year, just because one, I thought he's going to throw it more, and then two, I just I know the type of guy he is, and he's gonna he's gonna get some rips in there and see where things go. Um, but he's playing better, and he's putting K State in a position. And another thing, like what you're talking about, Drew, with being on pace for the touchdown thing, he's still 20th in the country in ESPN's QBR metric. So it's not like it's been a horrendous season. I think it's just after what Will Howard did last year, expectations were built to such a high spot. I had him too. And he just had some tough moments. And admittedly, like everybody's looked at the Oklahoma State game and said, yeah, he was bad in that game. You cannot, you cannot say anything other than Will Howard was bad in that game. But you know who was equally worse and, if, and maybe more? were his receivers. And we can point to some moments there where his receivers burnt him in that game and he just wasn't getting any help. And so I think that's another big thing that we've seen over the last few weeks is the K-State offense is now actually giving some help to their quarterbacks because they've played enough games where Colin Klein is able to say, okay, we know that we're not going to be able to have this. This is not going to work for us this year, but we do know that we have this. And that was I, I'll defer to fan here because I think one thing that we've noticed an elevated amount of in the last couple of week, weeks is all of the plays, you know, giving getting the ball to some of the receivers with the sweeps, and they're just finding different ways to do things now that make them more efficient and obviously have made them more successful with how, you know, they're tearing up things like their third down conversions. They were 10 of 14 on third down yesterday, so Colin Klein has started to get this thing dialed in because this is a much different beast than what he had last year where it was you had Malik Knowles who could go and make plays for you. That was clear. You knew you knew Cade Warner was a great number two. You had Ben Sennett. You obviously had Deuce Vaughn who was fantastic. And you don't have those things this year other than Ben Sennett. And so you're having to kind of feel your way through it. And it took a while because they just had a lot of guys that weren't what they expected them to be. And now that they figured it out, they're 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 kind of rolling on. Yeah, you, you K State ran seven jet sweeps the first six games combined, and they've run ten the last two games. Um, and I think we've seen, you know, <clears throat> Drew. I think you mentioned or Dy mentioned how hard Jaden Jackson runs on jet sweeps. Looked rem reminded you of Malik Knowles a little bit yesterday on the couple. He had very very good jet sweeps. Um, I think that's a big part of it. I think. You know, we had people declaring that Treshawn Ward was clearly the better running back um, after the Texas uh, Tech game. But since then, DJ Giddens has, has kind of emerged. His last 20 carries, he's gained 153 yards combined the last two games, 7.7 .7 yards per carry, and an 85% success rate on runs that DJ has been involved with the last two games, plus four catches for 100 yards and a touchdown. Big third down conversion yesterday on a running back screen, something we don't do often, but was effective. So DJ Giddens emerging, a um, little bit more power run, I think, the last couple of games. Um, I think you see more power pulling a guard, pulling a guard and tackle. The outside kind of sweep with pulling Hayden Gillum from the center spot. You've seen that a little bit more the last couple of games, and you've seen it be successful. So, um, those, those scheme changes, uh, some of that's dictated by the defense in the front you're seeing both last two weeks. Houston, you know, they asked Will Howard after the game, did they see the defense they thought they'd see that they threw out against Texas to kind of slow down Texas's running game? And Will was like, no, it was completely different again. It sounded like it was more of a three. So the last two weeks we've seen an odd front, three-man front um, with, with both TCU and, and Houston. So – you know, some of your game plan and how much you're in power versus zone is going to be dictated by that as well. But uh, in any case, the, that combination of jet sweep, power run, and DJ Giddens kind of stepping up the last couple of games has been a pretty good uh, combination of things to help this offense. You know, that was already pretty good, but now, you know, it scored over four points per drive the last two games, which is super impressive if you follow that stat. I think another thing to, to kind of throw <clears throat> in here is – They've also started to figure out which guys to get the jet sweeps to, where yeah. early on it seemed like it was pretty much Phillip Brooks. I mean, yeah. Brooks has five carries on the season, and four of them came in the Oklahoma State game or prior. So he's only had one in the last three weeks, and it did go for 10 yards against TCU. But 
they're using Keegan Johnson to get the ball into his hands because that's the weird thing about Keegan Johnson, who was out because he was banged up yesterday. But when he's been out there and the ball gets into his hands, he looks like the guy that we were promised. He looks like the guy that, you know, could, could do some serious things for K-State. But he's just had issues staying on the field, and it's been tough to get him the ball. But they started to get it to him in the sweeps. I thought against Texas Tech early on in that game, he had a really good one. I think maybe when uh, it would have been when, when Avery was into the game and they scored that touchdown on the first drive or this, this second scoring drive of the game, I mean. And then, obviously, Jaden Jackson, like you guys are talking about, has found a niche there. And we saw Jaden Jackson earlier in the season when they could get the ball to him. He was making good things happen. So I think just as much of the success that should be credited to Will Howard should also probably go to Colin Klein for finally figuring out, okay, this is how the pieces that I have for this offense this year are going to work. And moving forward, Fan, you're you're much better at this than I am. Moving forward, is this more of an anomaly for what we'll probably see from Colin Klein's offense and that it'll move back to something a little bit more, I guess what they maybe tried at the start of the year um, and, and be different because this seems like more of just a product of these are the pieces we have. They can't do these things, but they can do these. So let's do it as opposed to the trend for what's going to continue for however many years he's, he's the offensive coordinator at K-State. Well, I think that's a good question. The, the other thing we've seen, <clears throat> the last three games is the running game has been 64% or more of the offense in every game. Whereas early in the season through the first four or five games, at least we were throwing it more than half the time. Um, so we've seen a more dedicated approach to going back to running the football uh, and, and being successful with the run game. I think, you know, part of that was Avery Johnson and his skill set. but you know, Howard can still run it, but we've seen, I think, a part of it is too. Treshawn Ward and DJ Giddens kind of figuring out their role in the running game, and Colin Klein figuring out what each can do best, and and what play sets to pair with those guys. And then again, the emergence of, of some guys on jet sweeps, Jane Jackson and Keegan Johnson, especially. You know, I will say as good as we've seen Jace Brown emerge in the passing game, he was not good on jet sweeps yesterday, and yeah. he had. One of them he should have gotten a first down on. One of them he barely got a first down on. Um, but that was not probably his skill set quite yet. Mm-hmm. But Jaden Jackson looked really good. He had two for 15 yards yesterday. So that's – that's I think we're going to see – I'll be anxious to see what our run versus pass rate is going to be in, in, in Austin because I don't know – I don't know if we're going to be able to run it 65% of the time against the Longhorns and have the same sort of success against that defense because it's really good. So <clears throat> I think we are going to have to throw it a little bit more and be successful with the throwing game, which is, is good to see the success rate of the throwing game against Houston, but it's going to be a different monster against Texas. Yeah, uh, real quick, I'll throw this in there. Jace Brown on the, the one that nothing good happened on on the sweep. Uh, it seemed like one of those where he <clears> – <throat> He relied a little too much on the fact that he thought Treshawn Ward could could handle that block for him, <laughs> yeah, and that that was going to spring something massive instead of just taking what was there immediately. Um, so you know that that comes with experience, and maybe now he knows I'm not going to trust the the tiny running back to block for me. Yeah, I I also think that like they're they're just running more because this is they they've really kind of found their identity. I think they they were searching for an identity on offense, and and I think part of that comes with the offensive line not really playing particularly well in the first few weeks of the season, and now the offensive line has started to figure it out. And I think that the offensive line becoming what we thought has kind of translated into an identity of, hey, we're just going to run the hell out of the ball with a lot of different players. And they have a lot of a lot of dudes that can run the ball. I mean, at some point, I mean, we we brought up the Jace Brown running sideways a lot yesterday, which is frustrating. But at some point, because he's one of the fastest receivers they have, at some point, he's probably going to break one. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you just got to be patient with because he's he's 18 years old. And I'm excited because as somebody that like yeah i like throwing it all over the yard too i mean chiefs fans so like i get to watch patrick mahomes throw it all over the place on sundays but there's something that's really fun about just watching somebody just run and run hard at you 
And that, that's all K-State's been doing recently. And, and I think that you can have sort of the same formula for Texas as long as you're really efficient in the past game like they were yesterday. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. I think, you know, everything's looking pretty good right now for K-State, and they're just figuring things out better. And Will Howard playing better, being smarter with the football has a lot to do with it, but also he's he's being given better tools to work with this offense now. I think, you know, that's it's my new favorite tradition, uh, seeing the, like, former NFL players that have biases towards the position they played, and then they go to social media and they're dishing out blame everywhere. Uh, like whenever the the Chiefs' offensive line would be questioned, freaking idiot head Jeff Schwartz would just be like, "Well, actually, it's not my brother and his teammates' fault. That this is on Mahomes, or this is on this guy." And it's like, dude, shut up. If we're questioning anything about this Chiefs team, it is their offensive line. Look, Mitchell Schwartz, who actually played for the Chiefs, I enjoy the guy. He goes on Ryan Russillo's show. I think he's great there. I got no beef with him. Jeff Schwartz is the most annoying loser on Twitter who I I called him out one time. I was just like, dude, come on. He blocked me for it. And so then yesterday, uh, this is a little petty of me. Yesterday, obviously, Cooper Beebe has the, the big block where he you know killed the Houston guy. Um, somebody responds and they tag Jeff Schwartz in my video that I posted of BB flattening the guy. And I said, "Uh, uh-uh, he doesn't get to see this video. So I blocked him. So Jeff Schwartz (laughs) has been blocked. It's a little tit for tat. And uh, we'll just, you know, I hope he likes it and I'm making a stand there. But to what I'm saying about this, another guy who I don't dislike, but I just kind of laugh whenever I see it. Kurt Warner on Twitter loves to defend every quarterback out there and he will go and just be like well you know you just got you got to have this and this and this ready to go if you're a coordinator like give your quarterback these things and make sure that they're ready right there like don't make them work too hard you every once in a while you got to give them something easy like scheme this up for him and he's he's all about that i i don't know if he's right i don't know if he's wrong but every time i open up twitter there is kurt warner with a tweet about like the second string quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons, it's like if they had just given him this, then so what I'm saying here is Colin Klein is doing that for Will Howard right now. And some of it is because of Will Howard struggling earlier in the season, but I think a lot more of it has to do with the other pieces of the offense and just knowing that they can't do a handful of things that they're expected to. In a way, it's like the I'm not – I'm not being mean to you, but I, I kind of want you to know that you should feel bad about this, that uh, I think like teachers, coaches, parents do sometimes where it's like, it's not your fault that you can't do this, but we're going to do this instead just so, you know, we can actually be successful. And uh, I think that's kind of what's going on here for the K-State offense and it's working for right now. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. All right. Anything else from the game against Houston that sticks out? Cause like we talked about, I mean, Trying to find some overarching thing to talk about from this game other than quarterback is really tough to do. K State dominates 41 to nothing. They're six and two. So they're at least guaranteed to go to the Liberty Bowl now. So we can rejoice about that. Honestly, I mean, what do you guys say? They just lose the final four and we can go to we can go to Memphis, you know, lock it in. Uh, no thanks. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I mean Will Lee's interception was great, although I think it was more of a product of Donovan Smith getting tired and just like, I got to get rid of this football. Um, So anything from yesterday stick out? And again, your answer can be, nope, K-State kicked their butts and let's move on to next week. The linebackers have been really good the last few weeks. I I thought Desmond Purnell had another really good game. Austin Moore is the most consistent player on the team. I thought Austin Romaine... Uh, I thought Austin Romain played pretty well. Somebody breaking in? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll see if I. If, you know, it'll be on camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, th- I, th- I thought that uh, Austin <clears throat> Romain played really well. Uh, Jake Clifton has played really well the last few games. They're getting a lot more pressure, which. is funny because like yeah, Casey wasn't like bad in sacks uh, coming into the game, but it just kind of felt. 
Like they're they've left some some stuff out there, but it felt like they they the last three weeks that they've turned a corner and they're hitting the quarterbacks more because it used to feel like they were only getting quarterback hits if it was a sack, and now they're getting quarterback hits and sacks. So I mean, I don't know. The the coaching staff has started to really click, and the players are all on board, and it it's it's good vibes again for the third straight week. I'm going to see if I can figure that out. <laughs> yeah. I'm, you got sonar just, going off. Drew is the first person to find <laughs> the, uh, the, the Titanic submarine that sank. <laughs> I, I just had the havoc rate is 23.8%, which is um, the highest we've seen in, a, in a, several weeks. Um, part of that was there were some pass breakups as well, the interception, but pressure on the quarterback, tackles for loss. Um, and the, the other thing about that, Houston was like very good at preventing havoc. That was one of their strengths on offense coming in the game. So that's pretty good to, to, to get something done against, against that the offensive line, which I think is pretty good, even though they're not a run team, they're more of an offensive line that was pretty good at pass protection. And Donovan, and Donovan Smith was pretty good at avoiding uh, pressure. So that's, that was impressive. Uh, the concern side, like I, like you said, I, it's hard to come up with many more yeah. in that kind of game with that kind of win. So even special, special teams didn't do anything special, but they controlled field position. Uh, Houston was number one in the country in kickoff return uh, efficiency coming into the game in case they did a really good job against that. So nothing, I think we're pretty looking about as good as we possibly could have the last two games going into playing Texas. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 looking around and Drew and I kind of talked about this yesterday when it comes to like kickoff returns and everything that that goes with that right now. Um there really aren't a ton of opportunities anymore with the way that yeah. the rules are set up. So obviously you get the ball at the 25 now. That's been the rule for a while on touchbacks, but now that you can fair catch it anywhere inside the 25 and get it at the 25 it just makes a lot more sense to not to attempt to return it. And given K-State circumstances this year, it makes sense. It's really, special teams, though, has has gotten better over the last few weeks just because there's confidence now in what Chris Tennant's done. I mean, mm-hmm. he's he was great again yesterday. A kick was missed. It was not him, though. So anybody that wasn't paying like close enough attention, which, I mean, I wasn't. I just saw a missed kick. I was not paying attention. He was in the game until D.Y., was like, no, 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 not Chris Tennant, not my boy. It's okay. He's still really good. Uh, exact word for word what he said in the press box. So um, that, that's exactly funny. like that, too. Yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> and Jack Bloomer has been been great punting the football lately for K-State. And that was one of those areas where I thought he struggled a little earlier in the year, but now he's gone out there and it's been a while since I've gone, oh, that was kind of gross. Unlike the Houston punter who, I think every single one of his punts yesterday, I thought that didn't seem very good. And miraculously, it always seemed like Houston was punting into the wind yesterday. So I don't know how they managed to pull that off. But um, looking around the country, like on the kick return stuff, there are only, and this is just to tell you how like worth it it is, there are only 17 teams in the country that are even, even averaging like 25 yards on their returns. So if you f- figure that they're catching the ball at the goal line, they're getting it back to the the line that you would be set at, and only mm, like only eleven of them are at twenty six yards or better on their returns. Um, and some of these schools that are up there, average wise, they don't even return it that much. Um, the most attempts by any school this year at returning a kick, Texas State and Southern Miss, they've both taken it twenty four times. And you think we've played nine games now and those aren't necessarily good schools. So they're getting a lot of opportunities to return kicks and they're even saying, nah, we're good. We'll pass. So I just think it's kind of everything in general. Uh, shout out to, to Tyler Jackson, the, uh, the head man at Manhattan lifestyle magazine. He said this to me yesterday. He asked, do you, do you know the last time K-State didn't have a kick or punt return for a touchdown in a season? I have it somewhere, but oh, see, yeah, I know that I know the answer. This is this is a trivia question for you guys. Now he he gave the trivia to me. 
now I'm giving it to you guys. So uh, I'll say, hmm, I'll, I'll go oh four. That sounds like a bingo. Safe. Bingo. It was oh four. So I'd say that sounds like a yep. safe bet because it was like yeah, Snyder 1.0s fall off because Prince yep. had good returns too, and then Brandon Banks was still there in 09. So it, yep. Uh, yeah, but it, I mean, you're you're exactly right that I I just don't think that it's worth it to return kicks that much. I mean, we'll get into it when we talk about the whole Big 12, but I wonder if the OU kick returner is regretting returning that kick for no reason when he got back to the 25 and they lost like eight seconds on the return. I think OU is probably regretting a lot of things about what they, <laughs> they did yesterday or didn't do. But yeah, that was uh, not the, the kick return stuff. It just It's not worth it if you don't have the right guy back there anymore. You don't need to force it either. Like In the past, it made sense to try and work as hard as you could to make it happen. But there's just it doesn't make much sense, especially with how K State's offense is rolling right now. Where wherever you put them on the field, it feels like they're going to be able to go down and score and move the ball. So uh, that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Uh, real quick, we will uh, dive into a look at this week's Big Twelve action in our College Football Outsider. Take a peek at everything else that took place around the league. K State now tied for first place with every other school. Uh, in the conference after uh, quite the weekend. K-State got their big victory, 41 to nothing. KU surprises Oklahoma. I, I hate myself for this because all offseason and leading up to a couple weeks ago, I kept saying KU is going to win that game. KU is going to win that game. And they did. It just, I had changed my mind after Oklahoma played like crap last week against UCF. I thought there's no way they do it again against Jason Bean they should be able to, to handle this thing, and they didn't. They played like idiots. They played like the frauds that I've always assumed that they might be uh, with Brent Venables after what we saw last year. So bad loss for Oklahoma yesterday. The Big 12's playoff chances probably gone at this point. Uh, I, a one loss, a one loss team in this year's Big 12 probably doesn't deserve to be into the playoff. West Virginia takes care of UCF, 41 to 28. UCF still looking for that first Big 12 win. Texas dominates BYU 35-6. to Malik Murphy didn't really have to do a lot in that game. Texas's ground game was good. Steve Sarkeesian wanted to take it easy on BYU, but they just couldn't score. And then Iowa State handles Baylor. Iowa State had the lead from the get-go. Baylor was never a threat. And then Oklahoma State used a big second half to just blast Cincinnati. Ollie Gordon went over 200 yards again, was fantastic. So that is week nine in the Big 12 in the books now. Uh, I'll start with Fan. What is your big takeaway from this week in the league? Well, I, I, I do. The the KU win was in, was impressive just because of the way they did it. They pretty much <laughs> – Jason Bean made the play that he seems to always make and threw the interception, and oh, you had the ball at midfield. Really, all they had to do was get a first down, and the game's over. And uh, you're going against the KU defense, who's not very good but they kind of stepped up in that moment. You know, KU got another ridiculous defensive touchdown, which they seem to get often this year. Yeah. Um, so so that was, you know, an impressive win for them. I do think some of it was Oklahoma not being – not looking very well coached in that game. Um, not to discredit KU, but Oklahoma looked um, super conservative and – not very aggressive at times, and I would not expect that from a Venables coach team. Um, so, so that was a surprise. You know, the the newbies are now a combined three and seventeen in the Big Twelve. So, it, it's been a struggle. Um, BYU is probably the best, looking the best. Um, UCF not getting beat that badly by West Virginia was a little bit of a surprise to me. I thought they'd put up a fight and at least give them a game. Um, and you know, UCF was the team we talked about on paper coming into this year should be the best of the new teams. And I think they're getting beat up. I just noticed, you know, even listening to, to Dana Holgerson after the game, he said, this is power five football about 48 times. I think, um, this is the big 12 or this is power five football. So I think the reality of how hard it is to play power five, even when they get to play each other, 
which they haven't played very much. You know, we, we do we do get the exciting UCF Cincinnati matchup, the 0 and 5 team. Someone's got to win a game. Fine. Someone's going to get a win. So, uh, but but I do think it's reality for those schools. It's like, man, this is hard. And I think a lot of their fans are going, wow, what what did we sign up for? Maybe. So, I uh, I'm actually kind of rooting. I hope everybody stays healthy, stays alive. But I am rooting for a surprise 2023 COVID outbreak that that cancels that game, and so neither of them get a chance to beat each other, and they just can both lose out this season because uh, neither team deserves a win the way they're playing right now. And so it's unfortunate that one of them has to get it. Uh, real quick on KU, they are now tied for the lead in the country in defensive touchdowns this season, I believe. Um, I think let's see, and they. I think they're up to three or four. Uh, they're actually they're second. They're they're tied for second with three. The only team that has more defensive touchdowns this year than KU is the team that's cheating and knows what's coming on defense in Michigan. <laughs> they have four. So uh, that's that's the kind of rare air that KU is in. They've either been so good or so lucky this year that they are they are challenging the team that is cheating and literally knows what's coming uh, for defensive touchdowns. And it kind of goes to. Chris Kleiman's talked about it. You've talked about it, fan. Like, there's a lot of luck involved with turnovers, and KU's luck this season has been really good because you think about the games in which they've gotten them now. They have the one against Oklahoma that proved big. I mean, it gave them the lead from the jump, energized everybody, and obviously they, they win by a score. It goes on. But they had two of them against BYU in a game that they won by 11 points. And that's another thing where just like, if you're going to make the mistakes, you can give the game to KU. But if you don't make the mistakes, KU is going to make them and give it to you. And if you have the run game, you can do it. And that's honestly probably my biggest surprise from yesterday is, I mean, Oklahoma ran for 269 yards on KU. Five of their touchdowns were on the ground, and they still somehow lost that game. And it's all because they were stupid with the football. On the, the kick return, Dylan Gabriel has the pick six he throws. Um, you just, as long as you don't severely beat yourself, you can still beat KU. And I think that's honestly the biggest thing that's changed now with KU football is number one, they're good enough to where they can find their own ways to beat you occasionally, but they will also now be good enough to take advantage of your mistakes. And the game doesn't come so mm -hmm. easy to your opponent where we always had talked about in the past where if you didn't take KU seriously, or at least I always viewed it this way, and you went into a game and and kind of screwed around like Texas did that, you know, a couple of times against KU, they can beat you because they've always kind of had the skill position talent to be up there and, and do some things in the Big 12. But now they've got actually, you know, fans said we could see the bad coaching from Oklahoma. We can see the good coaching from KU, and True. it's made a massive impact. And I think that's kind of what the, the the big deal was yesterday. Yesterday, good coaching beat poor coaching. And, and it should work out like that a lot more if sports were totally fair. And so I think, I mean, people probably hate this in some way, but it was nice to see that, oh, you got penalized for all of their dumbness that went down yesterday. And a lot of that falls at the feet of Brent Venables, who – Outside of that that big win against Texas, where we and we know Red River, whoever should win that game, it doesn't matter when when they go to the Cotton Bowl. Everything else has just kind of been similar to what we expected this year. And Oklahoma just blew an easy path to the playoff because realistically, they probably have the easiest schedule in the Big Twelve this season, and they they blew that opportunity. So um, as much as I would have liked to have seen Oklahoma finish off KU there and and break. Uh, the, the Jayhawk hearts. I also, as we get further away from that game ending, enjoy that Oklahoma lost that game more and more and will continue to enjoy that. And now Oklahoma, and they're going to go a long time before they uh, get to, to have a win against one of the Kansas teams because both schools finished off with wins on their way out. Um, sure. Also, that means now that K-State has, out of the Big 12 schools, the longest active win streak against KU. Oklahoma had won 18 straight. That's gone by the wayside. K-State is there. Uh, anybody know who is second in that win streak race against KU? They're, they're a year off of K-State. They're one game off of K-State's current streak. 
Oklahoma State. Yeah. Not Oklahoma State because KU beat them last year. Oh, oh that's true. yeah. Yeah. Prior to that, I think it would have been Oklahoma State, but it is not O State. So, of the current schools, obviously, you know, some of them have not been around long enough. And the ones that are getting close to 10 years in, they've lost recently to KU. Uh, so, any, I'll, gi- I'll give you guys each one more guess that you can throw out there. It took Baylor? me a while yesterday to come up. It, it is Baylor. It's Baylor. Huh? Yep, it is Baylor. Hmm. So, good for the Bears. Uh, I do, I, they don't play this year, though, do they? I don't think KU don't think plays so. Baylor. So, Baylor will survive hmm. because <laughs> Baylor would not win that game this season. I can, I can guarantee I you that. I don't think so, yeah. So, all right, Drew, your thoughts from the Big 12 yesterday. Yeah, I mean, sticking with OU, uh, KU, because I think that's kind of the the biggest game of like wow uh, of the day in the in the league. It it kind of seems like OU the last three weeks because they had the bye week uh, after Red River just sat around and got fat and heard how good they were and how that they might make the playoff and how they were going to run the Big Twelve and they. Kind of, I mean, I I said after the game, probably something I shouldn't say on air, so I'll say the uh, PG version. Uh, they effed around and found out. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Look, we we can get away with a few things here. I I don't think I'm going to to allow the f bomb to be dropped on uh, the KSO show ever. So uh, thanks for doing that. Uh, so they, I mean, they they found out that if you don't bring your A game you are going to lose like it, you can get away with it against some teams. But like Chris climate has said, if you don't bring your a game, it's going to be hard for you to win. And, and it, it turns out that if you make one game, your super bowl and it comes on the first week of October and all you make like 8 million hype videos for winning the game. And two of your best <laughs> you make t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. And you make tattoos, t- <laughs> you make t-shirts and some of your players like pretend like they got uh, longhorn tattoos and, you get on Twitter and saying that like uh, something like I mean that Oklahoma that's... fears no one, but God fear or God fears Oklahoma or whatever. Like it turns out that when you do all that for one game and it comes at five weeks in or six weeks in, you're probably not going to play well the rest of the season. Uh, I like the idea of a, a shirt that says God fears Oklahoma. Uh, <laughs> it was a Texas fears Oklahoma. Oklahoma only fears God. Uh, but I mean, I look even as powerful as God might be, I I get scared going to Oklahoma sometimes. So he might as well. You know, it, it's a, maybe a state he skips over. Um, look, I the Oklahoma stuff. You're absolutely right, and the T-shirts and the tattoos is the most like 17, 18 year old way too into my high school football experience thing ever that Oklahoma did there for one win against Texas. I mean, that's your rival, like. I don't think I don't anticipate any K State player in the near future going out and getting an upside down Jayhawk tatted on them because the expectation is that you go into and win that game and you win one of them. Why is that significant? Like it, it's just one game, especially after getting your butt kicked the year before. Yeah, and like especially, I mean, I hope that those guys they lose every other game they play to Texas. As much as I don't like Texas. And I typically cheer for Oklahoma in that game. I want those guys to look like total losers walking around 40 years from now. It's like, oh, why do you have that tap? Well, we beat Texas one time. How many times were you playing in that game? Well, I was in college for five years. We went one and four against them. But I have this one tap from a season where we screwed the pooch and didn't make it to the playoff like we were supposed to. I mean, I just it's one of those deals where it's ridiculous. I can go on another little tangent here just about Oklahoma, Texas, that whole dynamic. It is the most rent free thing I've ever seen that almost every recruiting picture for, for an Oklahoma prospect, they'll, they'll do the horns down. <laughs> like, can you not do anything else? Like, why do you have to make it about Texas in your recruiting picture? Well, they're good. It's a little pandering, you know, Everybody, all the OU fans obviously love it, but yeah, it's funny that, OU's hand symbol has become just a derogatory one towards their rival as opposed to something that they can do themselves. Yeah, 
It, I don't know. But the other the other thing that uh, my major takeaway in the Big 12 is that the the top five has started to really separate from the the not so great teams. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think teams are starting to figure it out. I mean, who would have thought two months ago that we'd be talking about Iowa State, no Oklahoma State tied for the Big 12 lead? Yeah, the 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 top of the league has really started to separate from the bottom, which the bottom is rough yeah the bottom is very bad in the big 12 right now uh houston just surviving in 12th place with their one win uh, against west virginia west virginia should be in this thing right now they it should be a six-way tie for first place because they i mean west virginia winning yesterday at ucf and then they should not have lost that game to houston no matter how maybe not good west virginia actually is but uh, yeah, UCF and Cincinnati in the rear. Bunch of teams at two and two and three. I mean, th there are four backed up there, and then all the teams that are tied for first right now in the Big Twelve. I mean, what do we make, and how quickly are we going to sort out these standings now? I mean, it it could either get a whole lot clearer next week when uh, Iowa State and KU play, K State and Texas plays, OU and O State plays, which is actually an awesome weekend in the Big Twelve that you have your top six teams playing against one another next week. Um, but if, you know, some of the, the right scenarios play out, like if KU beats Iowa State and K-State beats Texas and O-State beats OU, we're still confused as heck because the three teams that then would have won, you feel like oh, they, they're still going to have games they can lose on the way. OU and Texas, the schedule is pretty easy after this weekend. And so it could make for a, a much murkier uh, jaunt to the to the end for the, the Big 12. But uh, what do do what do we make of the standings and kind of what awaits next week? Well, you may, uh, Oklahoma State, I would say, has the easiest after this week because they 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 have to uh, play three new schools: UCF, Houston, and BYU. So Oklahoma State could benefit, I think, the most from winning Bedlam. Oklahoma has West Virginia, BYU, TCU um, after Oklahoma State, so that that. Is somewhat interesting, and Texas has uh, TCU, Iowa State, Texas Tech after this game. Iowa State and KU have – Iowa State has a tougher road because they have Texas and us after playing KU, so that, that will be interesting. And KU has us left plus Texas Tech and Cincinnati. So it's – in the unbalanced schedule world, it, it is interesting to see who's got what and who's played who, and, you know, because so far – um, the toughest schedules, um, Cincinnati and UCF, their combined opponent records for Big 12 play are 16 and 9. So <laughs> the, the teams they've played, you know, part of it is because they played them and, yeah. and beat them. But so it easily makes sense that your worst teams have the best record of, of their opponents. But K State's is only 9 and 16 so far. We've we've got arguably one of the the tougher schedules left. But Iowa State can kind of say the same. Because I think probably Iowa State probably has the toughest schedule in the league this year. Yeah, I mean Iowa State, they've got KU, K State, and Texas all left on the schedule. So that's yeah. tough. And I mean, it it's wild that Oklahoma State gets to play all four newcomers this year. Yes. Because I think you look around, most every other school, they played like only two of them. And it's like, yeah, you either get these two or these two. O State getting to play all four. It, it's almost like the Big 12 treated them as an afterthought. It was like, well, we actually don't expect much from them this year. They were like us, and they're like, so however you need to make the schedule work, just give it to them. Like, whatever. You know, that's that's fine. And so the schedule maker, the, the computer spit out four games against the newcomers. A little did we know that the four newcomers would – well, we knew they wouldn't be good, but I don't think we expected some of them to be this bad. And it's been a gift to Oklahoma State because, yeah, if they, if they beat Oklahoma this weekend by some miracle – which it's not out of the realm of possibility in Stillwater, Brent Venables. I mean, you know, fine, fine defensive coordinator, fine player, uh, might not be a so fine head coach. So it could happen, and they they could easily be uh, headed to Arlington. The only thing is, as better as they've been, I still don't trust them to go and win a game at UCF and Houston blindly. Like, I still think that that's something where they could screw up, but – it'd be really tough to do based on how those other teams are playing. So uh, that's that's at least something to, to kind of take into consideration. Yeah, I, I, I think that you're 
Exactly right there, because I, I think that Oklahoma State probably has the thinnest margin of error among the five schools at the top, where if they play their B or C game, they they probably get beat and potentially beat bad. Yeah, that's probably a, a good point. All right, uh, looking ahead real quick to next week in the Big 12, there's the, uh, the Week 10 schedule. Texas Tech TCU gets it started on Thursday. Uh, that'll be fun for a lot of people, I'm sure, to to watch. Uh, e- whoever wins that game, you're going to at least be like, well, there's some hope. And whoever loses, it's going to be burning down the city. Yeah, uh, loser doesn't go to a bowl, probably. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that would be Tech's sixth loss. And we know that they have a, a tricky schedule down the stretch. TCU also uh, has a tricky one down. Because I think TCU, after this week, they still have both Texas and Oklahoma on their schedule, uh, if correct. I'm not mistaken. So that's correct. Yeah. So th- if they lose, they're in a tough spot. Honestly, if Tech wins that game, both teams are probably not going to bowl games. Would be my my guess. Uh, and then K State Texas has been tabbed for Big Noon on Saturday, so they'll be ready to go first first game to kick on Fox, and then Oklahoma Oklahoma State two thirty on ABC. And then the other primetime window, KU at Iowa State is an ESPN game, which is significant just in the the fact that all three of these Big 12 games that are really big and good for this coming week, they all got their own separate but really good TV slots with the 11 a.m. game on Fox, the midday game on ABC, and then a night game on ESPN, which, by the way, like the night game next week is Washington-USC on ABC. So – uh, there m- might be some people looking around to find something different going on because Washington might score 50 on USC. I mean, Cal scored 49 and Cal sucks. So uh, Washington might have an easier go. And then all those other games mixed in there. The only note I have on that, Baylor will be playing in their third straight ESPN Plus game. I didn't think that was possible. I thought that the Big 12 would just be at least a little nicer and considerate and not throw – a team on ESPN Plus that many weeks in a row, they are doing it to Baylor, and that is how bad Baylor is, and that is how big of a fraud Dave Aranda is. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Pretty um, bad. I, I mean, the the other three games, it's kind of just like some somebody has to win. Somebody has to win in Baylor and Houston. Somebody has to win in Cincinnati and UCF. And then... BYU West Virginia is kind of interesting because I, I thought coming into uh, yesterday that BYU was probably the worst five and two team in the country. So it, it's interesting to see like how they respond to losing to Texas. And now, because if you look at BYU and how they are, they could be a team that starts five and two and finishes five and seven. And, and I don't think that any of us would be shocked. No. Yeah, yeah, because they have Iowa State, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma State after West Virginia, so pretty tough road. Well, yeah, that's uh, like we'll we'll see how it goes. Uh, real quick, we'll uh, we'll we'll pass this along, and I don't know that any of us have massive uh, takes on this right now, but it should be mentioned because it's it's important to note. Uh, this Kellis just tweeted this out, Kellis Robinette. Uh, Naquan Tomlin was arrested this morning for disorderly conduct and brawling or fighting uh, at Tubby's in Manhattan. So he was released on $750 bond, uh, and that was from the Riley County Police Department's daily report. So uh, with the first game, it's an exhibition, uh, but not great, uh, especially if you've been following along at KSO and having questions about where was Naquan Tomlin, and then he's, he's appeared and everything seems to be going in the right direction there. Uh, and then for this to happen, certainly not a good way for uh, things to start, especially when, I mean, I don't know. There's and there's no good excuse for that uh, to begin with, but also just given the circumstances of what this season can be for K-State and what you need from Naquan Tomlin and how things need to go, um, not good. I mean, it feels like it's been a while since we've had a significant K-State player, football or basketball, have something like that come about um and look the this staff they can't control their players a hundred percent of the time but there is an element to this that feels a little bit more disappointing that 
this staff of Jerome Tang and everything else that this would happen under their watch. And again, I'm not putting this on them. It's just a little surprising given the nature of how everything else goes. So, uh, I mean, crappy way to end the show for us, but uh, that needed to be put out there because that just came across. So we'll uh, have to monitor that situation moving forward now. And I'm sure that uh, D.Y. and I can can look into it more tomorrow, see what else comes out. And then obviously uh, there is a game on Wednesday against Emporia State. So we'll see how things go there. And and now we're eight days away from K-State USC taking place to start the season in Las Vegas. So uh, I don't know. I, I don't have great words for everybody right now to, to try and spin this or, you know, be chipper and positive and, I'm sure some people will feel just like I am right now. Others are probably going to think that I'm I'm too harsh or unfair for even bringing it up or whatever else. But it needs to be mentioned, and it's a it's a very disappointing and and upsetting thing. So we'll we'll see what happens uh, moving forward. And obviously, there's there are multiple sides to tell from it. So who knows? Maybe there was a good reason why Naquan Tomlin was involved in the situation. But I know one thing: I've never appeared in an arrest report, and so if you appear in one things will happen occasionally. And, and the, you know, that's, it doesn't mean that you were necessarily in the right when that happens. So I don't know, tough to, uh, tough to digest right now. And I should probably just shut up. So uh, that will do it for this edition of the KSO show. Sorry for bumming everybody out at the end. Stay happy though. I'll put it on the screen one more time. K-State kicked Houston's butt yesterday, 41, nothing. K-State's tied for first place in the big 12. They've got a big matchup on big noon this weekend against Texas. So K-State still has it all in front of them. And the, you might be able to start to tell yourself in the back of your head, hey, it could happen. It could happen. Uh, I'm starting to feel the exact same way. And by Friday, I may just be crazy enough to say that K-State wins the game. Not there yet, but they are at least playing well enough to make me think about it. So that will do it for myself, Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO Show. Stay locked in with everything else we got going over at K-State Online because Patrick Ngongbo was in town this weekend. So that's going to be something to follow all week. He commits next Saturday. We'll see if it's K-State or Duke. And then, obviously, the big buildup for K-State Texas and our first peek at basketball on Wednesday as they get ready for USC in the start of the season come next Monday. So that is it for us at K-State Online. Thanks for watching and listening.